usual opening comments. If you'd uh, resist from making a recording, by the curtain needs to be open. Um, fire alarm, there's no alarm planned for today, so if it goes off, it's for real. Follow our officers who will show us what to do and where to go. Smoking is not permitted inside the building. Toilets just across the corridor. <coughs> if you're leaving the meeting uh, for any reason, um, please switch off any recording equipment. Uh, privacy and confidentiality. Just to make the point that the final item on the agenda uh, is uh, an exempt item. But it's been printed on white paper rather than pink. Uh, no problem. But just uh, please, at the end of the meeting, if you could hand those back in and uh, keep them uh, sealed way during the meeting. Uh, it is to appear that the proceedings of the meeting are to be recorded. If anyone who has a problem with that, please let me know. Mobile phones, usual request, turn them to silent. So I am Councillor Leslie Byron, Chairman of this meeting, which I now declare open. Um, so, can I just check that everybody has uh, the table um, Labour Party, Majority Party uh, budget. Um, there is also uh, a, a, a supplementary page, or an amended page, for one of the uh, ILFP pages. Slight change, it's just been uh, printed wrong. Um, and also there's a dispensation, which everybody should have, to be signed uh, to enable them to vote uh, correctly. Could I announce that um, the rural, uh, uh, one of our partner authorities, has uh, replaced uh, Councillor Chris Meaden with Councillor Adrian Jones. Councillor Jones is here and you are very welcome to join us. Um, so apologies, we have apologies so far from Councillors Roberts, Andrew Makinson and Preston, I think. Any other apologies we're aware of? No. Uh, are there any declarations of interest from colleagues? Are there any, uh, there's no matter of urgency, there's no need to change the uh, order of the agenda. And as I say, item 6, tender for the provision of, is an exempt item. So, we will move into the, uh, into the meat of the agenda, uh, and so that is item 3, the minutes to approve and sign the minutes as a correct record. Are they agreed, colleagues? Yes, yes. I will sign them due, due to course. <coughs> uh, so next is... Um, item 3, the Asset Management Plan. These are on pages 17 to 98. Thanks, Chair. That's just got to the, the proposals themselves. The purpose of the report is to uh, outline how the party utilises its assets, its physical base, to achieve its corporate goals, particularly in relation to our integrated management plan. The asset management plan is broken up into three specific areas. The state plan, which looks after our buildings, our, and our land, uh, our ICT asset management plans, and our transport asset management plans as well. So the combination of those three things uh, allow the service to, to deliver uh, the outcomes of the integrated risk management plan. The plans themselves detail how we do that and the money that's been allocated to each of those particular areas. Um, and, and probably, if I may share, I'll probably leave it that block specific and let anyone talk to talk, talk me through any key aspects of that. Okay, so we've got um, Asset Management Plan 1920, 23 24. Are there any specific questions on that? Otherwise, can that item be agreed? Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll move on to item four. Uh, this is what we're here for. The fire rescue budget and financial plan 1920 through 2324. Thanks, Chair. The budget and financial plan report presented to the authority <coughs> provides the necessary financial information for members to approve a financial strategy and set a, bar and set a balance for 2019 20 revenue budget and preset level in line with the relevant statutory requirements. Subject to all financial assumptions remain robust and successful implementation of £1 million of debt savings from 2021, 
the proposed financial plan will deliver the funding for the required increased investment in frontline services to meet the risks identified in the supplementary IRMP report. In terms of the risks around the assumptions in the plan, the key ones are that annual pay awards will not exceed the 2% assumption, that the government will make a £2.1 million contribution from 2021 towards the £2.8 million <coughs> increase in the fire pension scheme employee rates following the government changes to the scheme and that from 2021 the financial settlements for the authority will increase by one and a half percent a year. The report sets out in paragraphs 50 to 65, pages 117 to 121, the proposed five-year capital programme and potential borrowing requirements. As per the table on page 118, the total capital programme provides an investment of £36.5 million, of which £21.4 million has been funded from provincial borrowing. This includes new schemes totaling £3.6 million, but most of this increase relates to the addition of the new year, 23-24. Paragraph 66 to 77 on pages 121 to 124 outline how the minimum revenue provision, which is the sum that will be set aside each year to repay debt associated with capital expenditure will be calculated. Paragraphs 78 to 87 of pages 125 to 127 outline the impact of the proposed capital investment over a number of predetermined prudential indicators to determine its affordability and sustainability, and that all forecast debt is for capital investments only and within the total capital financing requirements. Paragraphs 88 to 90 on pages 128 to 137 outline the authority's treasury management strategy. The proposed investment strategy is consistent with the current strategy and recommends continuing with the current institutional limits and minimum credit ratings. The proposed authorised limit for debt is £53 <coughs> for borrowing and that will ensure that gross debt does not exceed the capital financing requirements and the borrowing is only incurred for capital investment. All costs associated with the proposed five-year capital programme and prudential borrowing have been built into the proposed medium-term financial plan, and associated borrowing is deemed to be sustainable and affordable. Section G of the report reviews the performance of the current plan, its assumptions and the delivery of the approved savings option. And as outlined in the table on page 144, Additional costs and funding has been built, has been identified since the approval of the 2018-19 plan, and that has now been built into the proposed 2019-20 plan. These changes are outlined to members of the budget strategy then, but the most notable changes are the increase in the fire pension scheme employer rate due to the reduction in government support of 2.2 million on top of the 0.6 billion previously built into the plan. A one-off government grant of 2.6 million in 2019-20 to partially cover this increase in the five pension scheme. <coughs> An assumption that the government will provide permanent funding of 2.1 million from 2021 towards the increase in the five pension scheme. A permanent one million pound increase in the budget for frontline services to meet the proposed new investments in operational response and protection risks identified <coughs> within the supplementary IRMP. As a result of all these changes, although the 2019-20 financial position remains balanced, a £1 million financial challenge from 2020-21 has been identified. But Section H on pages 146 to 150 looks at the possible saving options for the authority to consider in order to rebalance the proposed financial plan from 2020-21. Paragraph 119 and 120 outline the possible options for meeting the challenge by repaying historic debt off early to free up debt services and budgets and assuming that the current forecast improvements in the local government pension scheme fund position materialises once the 2019 actuary review is completed and therefore the current 0.8 million budget committed to the repayment of historic debt contributions would then be available. Taking these savings into account, the updated plan is outlined on page 150. Although a small outstanding financial balance remains from 2022-23, members are asked to note this at this time due to the significant 
uncertainty around future year spending and funding assumptions. Pages 151 to 155 identify the anticipated reserves over the financial plan period and the proposed use of these reserves. The authority is recommended to maintain the general fund reserve at the current level of £2 million, which equates to 3% of the net operating expenditure budget. Of the £23 million of committed reserves, most of this is expected to be utilised over the next two years. And finally, pages 156 to 157 identifies the £29.2 million needs to be raised from the council tax preset in 2019-20 to balance the revenue budget. That would require an increase in the council tax band D preset of 2.99% to £2.28, raising the figure from £76.56 to £78.84. Members are asked to approve the report recommendations in paragraph 2. I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, uh, Any questions uh, on the Treasurer's presentation? Not a question, just a, just a comment to say thank you very, very much. This is a wonderful budget that's been delivered through very, very hard times with wonderful staff and a wonderful Chief Fire Office <coughs> Officer. And if anyone finds fault with this, well, let them come back with an alternative. Because in my 14 years on this department, <coughs> I can't see anything alternative to this or, or anything as good as this. So uh, I'm saying thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. I mean, just to echo <coughs> what Councillor Sullivan said, I mean, this is um, a really optimistic outlook for us. I mean, Let's hope it, it continues that way because we certainly um, have not um, been presented with budgets with uh, quite so much optimism in, in, um, in the past. So, um, as Councillor Sullivan said, if anybody's got any alternatives, then come forward with them. Well, I certainly haven't. Um, so, although we clearly don't need my vote uh, to get this budget through, I will be supporting it and uh, I wish all of well in, in the future. Um, particularly as it's probably Councillor Sullivan's last budget meeting. My thanks um, on record to um, to her and thanks for any part that you played in this show. So, uh, so yes, Chair, I'm happy to support this budget today. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to endorse everything that my colleague just said and um, really congratulate the officers. Just, just the one area though um, I've, I've got concern with, and that's on page one, two, and nine, which is really something that we've had nothing to do with. I think we all know, uh, just by turning the television or buying the paper, the mess that our country's in at the moment and getting towards. We don't know what. People can come the edge of the cliff or the precipice, whatever expression comes out, and uh, it's to do with Brexit. Can you tell me when, on, on the page eight, you, you, I think you're putting that. Dependent on what kind of Brexit we have, uh, in the event of a disorderly Brexit, then cuts in the base rate would be the next move. Do you think that would be a situation that if we, if we clash out, as its expression is, that the base rate uh, of, the, of, of the Bank of England would be reduced rather than increased? And I was just wondering on that basis, because that is the only thing that, because it's a great report, everything's fantastic in it, and it's the one thing that you have no control over that all other than what governments are going to give us. Um, thanks. I mean, this issue is around in terms of the cost of borrowing. Yeah. So we borrow money from the public works loan board. And ultimately what drives that interest rate is how easy it is for the government to attract external money from outside the country. So if Brexit results in a difficulty in the country attracting you know, external money, then interest rates could go up and borrowing could go up. Yeah. It's the opposite way around and the country is still seen as a safe place <coughs> for people to put the money in. It's unlikely, I think, that there, there would be uh, an increase in public rate loan board interest rates. Uh, and if it actually goes down, which is a potential indication, then that might result in actually cheaper borrowing for us. And the associated implication of that is when we borrow money, we have to service that debt. If <coughs> interest rates are lower, it'd actually be cheaper for us to, to service that debt rather than the opposite. And, and a higher figure. I think for me, in terms of Brexit, in general terms, the biggest risk we have is, we said about future government funding, 
So the assumption is that government funding will increase by 1.5% from 2021, because we've had our 1920 figure. So it's the risk around what's the future in terms of government support. So if the government's austerity potentially would have to continue as a result, but that would mean the five wouldn't get 1.5% increase in 2021. And they find themselves in the or a risky scenario a reduction. So the risk, I think, is more about not we're trying to set the budget for 1920, it's about 2021 onwards. And what Brexit, what the economy, and what priority fire is given in terms of the overall uh, government spending limits relative to the services. Because of what we do uh, as a national lead on uh, resilience, uh, our officers um, and some of them are involved quite closely with the planning for you know, what might happen with Brexit. But where the interest rates are going to go, well, you know, that is speculation. Uh, but, um, you know, we are at the forefront of the national picture on this. That's Yeah, thank you, Jay. I'd like to make a few comments on the, the overall situation, please. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I've got the budget here to move. Yeah. Uh, and it, would it be better to move the budget? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce that and then uh, ask colleagues to make general comments and questions uh, to officers. So, if there's any more questions, um, if not, I'll uh, move the budget topic. Now, the Labour Group budget, uh, which is, of course, the majority group budget has been laid on the table. It's been embargoed until today, uh, but it, enc it encapsulates all of the things that we've discussed. There's no shocks to surprise here uh, at the uh, way down. So firstly, I'd like to thank Ian Cummings and his team in the finance department for helping to produce this year's budget and for generally keeping us on a good financial track all year. We always have very good feedback from the external auditors and we are always seeing being one of the strongest financial achievers in the fire sector. Secondly, I would like to thank our new Chief Fire Officer and his Principal Officer team, congratulating them on their appointments this year and for the work that they do both locally and nationally to keep us in this county safe and to show that Mersey Fire is a national leader in resilience and innovative thinking and public safety. I'd also like to thank the members of the Fire Authority. Uh, this is my first year as Chairman and Councillor Sullivan as Vice Chairman. Uh, members have worked very closely with our Principal Officers to develop our new plan. Uh, our thanks are also to the five district uh, leaders <coughs> and the county leadership for the help and support they have given us. And at this point, also to, to note that Councillor Sullivan, you've had one year in, <laughs> then, one year. then one year out. <laughs> Whatever. But thank you um. all for the help and assistance you've given to me as Chairman and Councillor Sullivan as Vice Chair. Yeah, it's very very much appreciated. You, I'd also like to thank, put on record, uh, thanks to our fantastic staff, both the firefighters and the fire stoppers. We have a difficult year, we've had wildfires and many other major incidents, and yet we've been able to maintain one of the fastest and most consistent speeds of attack in the country at some 5.4 minutes. We've continued with the building of the new fire stations. We've moved forward with the day crewing system. We've seen the not largest number of new firefighters recruited and trained for many years. <coughs> and members have been pleased to go and see them pass out in front of the uh, proud families. Our community fire safety and our home safety uh, checks are seen as national notable best practice and our fire deaths this year are gained amongst the lowest in the country. So this year's budget, which is presented here for you, is about a new broom soup and clean, against that background that we still have to tolerate of continuing national austerity, further government budget cuts, and more pressure on our finances. The government have never undertaken an assessment of the impact of fire service cuts around the country, and we have asked several times. My predecessor used to ask them time after time. 
We appealed for a one-off financial settlement for this year for Merseyside, but this was rejected by the government, and we have had to find solutions from within our own resources, which is the budget which is being presented to you today. The Chief has given us the challenge to find a million pounds to move to the front line. We know, we know, this won't be easy. It will involve consultation on changes to the IRA. To anyone in Merseyside, the idea of having 35 regions on the run rather than 26 <coughs> has got to really uh, you know, show you that the, the direction of travel is undoubtedly the right one, and it's got to be a winner. Recruiting more firefighters with an expansion to three training courses a year, redesignating some of our stations for special services, having a brigade fire engineer and expanding the number of people in the fire protection department are all the bonuses of the Chief's new eye on what we need to do to prepare ourselves for the future. As usual, most of the budget was outlined at the strategic, uh, Strategy Away Day and when we engaged with our stakeholders and members, asked would it be possible to find this money and make these changes. Let's hope that by setting today's budget, consulting on the IRMP, <coughs> by the work of our financial wizards, they'll be able to find the money and we'll be able to make the changes. Her Majesty's inspectors were in the authority a few weeks ago, and we don't know exactly what we have to say, but I believe, my view, that we will find many examples of nationally credited notable practice, and they will help us to draw a line on the past history of the authority. Now that we have a fresh plan, fresh challenges to make Merseyside even safer than it has been in the past. As I have said, on many occasions, from here and from there, our political objective is that Merseyside will be the safest place in England from a fire point of view. And I believe this budget and these plans will help to continue with that joint ambition. So therefore, colleagues, I recommend this budget <coughs> and the document to the authority. Thank you, Chair. I think over the years we've seen a massive reduction in appliances, fire stations, firefighters, and support and control staff, thereby risking the ri uh, increasing the risk to the communities that the service works so hard to protect. We collectively have called on the government to cease any further cuts to the budget, fund a real increase in firefighters' pay, and to undertake a full and proper evaluation of the impact of all these cuts to date, have you yourself was referred to, Chair. I'd like to place on record my wholehearted thanks and appreciation for the work undertaken by the Fire and Rescue Service, firefighters and support staff for their dedication, commitment and continuing professionalism in very difficult circumstances in keeping our communities safe. Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service are still facing significant and in many cases unreasonable financial challenges <coughs> and I think this has been compounded by a real terms 50% reduction to its revenue support grants since the year 2010 and I think I'm right in saying Chair that this is the most severe cut of any fire and rescue service anywhere else in the country. By the next financial year the service will have lost 350 firefighter posts and 200 support service posts again since 2010. And these are not changes that I'm sure the Fire and Rescue Authority would have even considered if it wasn't for the serious challenges put down to us by central government. Now I believe there's now a growing recognition that the Fire and Rescue Service cannot sustain any further cuts. The cuts imposed by governments on Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority have already gone too far. They should be reversed in the interest of public safety. And I think as a fire authority, we need to work closely with people such as the uh, constituent district councils, mayors Anderson and Rotherham, the MPs, the FBU and all trade unions to jointly lobby the government to demand assurances that the cuts imposed should be reversed and that the case for increased funding for MFRA will be fully considered again on the basis of public safety. As an absolute minimum, the government should commit to ensuring that there be no further grant reductions applied to the Fire and Rescue Authority and that the authority will be fully protected in relation to the new uh, financial burdens. 
So basically what I'm saying to you, as far as the cuts are concerned, I think we're all agreed, enough is enough. Coming on to this year's budget, I would like to applaud the efforts of the Chief Fire Officer, the Chair and Vice Chair of the um, MFRA, and in particular now I'd like to pay tribute to Sharon, because I believe this is going to be her last meeting, her last budget meeting uh, as Vice Chair. I think she's done a fantastic job over the last 12 months, and I hope we'd all wish her the best of luck in the future. She's done a fantastic job over the last 12 months. But I'd like to thank everybody involved in producing this budget, including me, uh, and say thank you very much for what you've done. We've got lots of challenges facing us still, but I'd like to applaud the people who brought us to this stage, and I, for one, will be giving full support to the proposed budget today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, comments or... So I'll put the uh, resolution, those who are in favour of the uh, budget that is standing on the table. Second. Oh yeah, need a second there. Second. Second. Uh, those in favour? Thank you, that's unanimous. Right, uh, so uh, now I move on. Uh, thank you colleagues, thank you very much for that. I think this is an opportunity for a reboot, it will reset. You push the, 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 the off button and then it's come back on. And the opportunity now to just have a, a proper look at why we do what we do and how we <coughs> keep the public safe. Thank you very much. And, and as I may say, from the point of view of the inspectors when they come in, I think they can see an authority where members and officers, both senior <coughs> and all ranks, work well together and there are no issues of, of governance uh, here. And uh, you know, our method of working, I think, could well be shown as being another example of national best practice. Yeah. Uh, so we move on to item 5, which is the draft uh, 19 to 21 IRMP supplement. There's an amendment page. It's page 175 to 226. Thank you. Chair. Further directing on from the, the budget resolution and unanimous approval. And it's in relation to then how we go about delivering the best possible services for the public. And members will be clear you know, from the strategy day itself, we, we talked about some of the work that we've done leading up to this particular point. And I'll just re-emphasise a couple of the kind of key aspects of that, which Councillor Kenny's already alluded to. You know, part and part of the authority uh, officers, you know, extensive amounts of lobbying has been undertaken <coughs> to to secure additional funding for Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority over the course of many months now. Um, you know, some of it will be long-term investments in the relationships which are struck um, in the short term, the outcomes of that lobbying position as being you know, for us to secure uh, what we had previously, which is the potential for increased council tax of just under 3%. So for all intents and purposes, our position had not altered. And so if you took that into consideration then, moving forward, the authority would then seek to deliver against the RMP proposals that were struck in 2016-17, which delivered that, that proposed budget in an effective and efficient way. However, given you know, recent times, we've had a number of significant incidents which have affected Merseyside, <coughs> but equally affected the UK nationally, you know, terrorist incidents, you know, Grenfell Tower, Saddleworth Moor, Winter Hill, you know, wildfires, our own issues around the Liverpool Arena car park fire, which have given me as the Chief Fire Officer and officers a cause to concern and a you know, cause to review the proposals that we put forward in the first instance. As a result of that, I've spoken to the authority on numerous occasions now, particularly at the strategy day, which is about reinvesting in the front line um, and doing so in a way which meant we are able to be as efficient and as effective as we possibly can. So what is proposed within the RMP is that, you know, it's the first time for many, many years, and certainly the first time since uh, I, I was the Deputy Chief and now the Chief, where we have talked about reinvesting in the front line uh, and front line services, which will better protect the public of Merseyside. <coughs> Particular focus has been on some of the kind of key aspects of some of the issues that we felt we had to deal with, the, the resilience within the service and increasing our resilience to be able to cope with a large and protective instance and also issues around our ability to protect the business community and protect relevant persons who are operating within the work environment and so on and so forth. As a result of that, the proposals lie before you. Um, and the proposals are struck on the basis of, of us meeting what we perceive to be foreseeable risk, 
which reflects directly back into the national framework, which it places a requirement on you as the authority and me as the chief file officer to deliver that on your behalf. And I reference this at the strategy day, but just for your information, I will, I will review what I said at the time. And under our requirements around the national framework, it requires us to identify and assess risk. And it says every fire and rescue authority must assess all foreseeable risk uh, related to risks that could affect their communities, whether they are local, cross-border, multi-authority, and or national in nature, from fires to terrorist attacks. The regard must be had to the community risk registers produced by the local resilience forum <coughs> and any other local risks analyzed, analyzed as appropriate. It goes on to say fire and rescue authorities must put in place arrangements to prevent and mitigate these risks either through adjusting existing provision or effective collaboration and or partnership working to build new capabilities. And the reason I'm suggesting or reading that particular aspect of the, the, the framework out is because that is exactly what we have done as part and parcel of the revisit of the proposals which were contained within the original IMP and to suggest there are alternative ways to deliver positive outcomes for the public. But they do necessitate the authority investing £1 million pounds in frontline services. The report itself goes on to detail where I believe those reinvestments to take place and evidence was what the difference would make to the communities we serve. So if I draw members' attention to page 176, and particularly under paragraph 7, and apologies, but I think it's important that I will relay exactly what the proposals are. For the proposal to improve our emergency response, and resilience by having up to 30 appliances available day and night, yeah. a combination of whole time and retained appliances. This is an increase of the 26 in the original RMP proposals. We propose to achieve this increase in the number of fire engines from 26, which is actually 18 fire engines immediately available 24 7 and 6 day crews, uh, immediately available during the day with 30 minute recall, and two fully whole time retained appliances, which are available on 30 minute recall. I'm changing that from that 26 figure to 30 by providing 20 appliances which are immediately available. Uh, six day crude fire engines immediately available on a 30 minute response at night and three whole time retainer fire appliances which are available on a 30 minute recall and a search and rescue appliance. Ultimately, in practical terms, this will mean us having 27 appliances during the day instead of 24 um, and 30 appliances available over the period through the night time as well. And that includes 21 immediately available appliances during the night time with a further 9 available within the 30 minute response. So move from 27 plus 3 of a day to 21 plus 9 of an evening, which moves us from 24 plus 2 of a day and 18 <coughs> plus 8 of a night, just to be absolutely specific there. This will introduce multiple fire engines at three locations, taking the best from the operational duty systems that we have, combining them under a hybrid model. This approach will provide two fire engines during the day and one retained at night, and one fire engine during the night and two retained. The day crew and whole time retained stations identified for conversion to the hybrid model are Liverpool City, Wallasey and St Helens. The specific details are captured later on in the proposals, but in effect that would keep nighttime cover available in Liverpool City and Wallasey over the period. Uh, of the IMP and beyond. With regards to protection, the proposals are increase the number of protection officers by five uh, and introduce a fire engineer and support the development of a new management information system. And again, that is the investing in areas where we know the HMIC, so the inspectors have identified issues, not just Merseyside specific, but nationally, and it goes some way to offset the implications <coughs> of the Judith Hackett review into the Grenfell Tower fire. From a response perspective, the proposals are to increase the number of firefighters from 620 to 642. This is the first time we've increased the number of firefighters in almost 10 years. In fact, it's probably even beyond that. Uh, plus 20 in training at any particular time. Uh, Councillor Byron Chair has already identified the fact that we will be bringing 60 individuals into Merseyside year on year for, for the next five years to ensure ourselves that we are able to maintain that 642 figure which is part of our proposals. Uh, we, we intend to you know, establish a ridership factor of five key locations to ensure that at least nine personnel are available to respond to life risk incidents across the whole of Merseyside. 
And again, it's probably you've made this out as somewhat an outlier with regards to other services, but we feel that is the correct and most appropriate way to response. We intend to re-establish key manager key locations and to utilise them elsewhere as part and parcel of their development pathway. Uh, we intend to enhance our response to terrorist threat uh, and marine and flood related incidents from stations Liverpool, City and Wallasey respectively because that is responding to the identification and assessment of foreseeable risk. We know those risks are there and we need to ensure that we are equipped to deal with them. We, as I say, the important point we maintain the nighttime cover at Liverpool City and Wallasey based on the introduction of that hybrid model. Uh, and we will redistribute our specialist appliances accordingly to the duty system that we've currently got in operation. Page 178 provides you with a kind of a, a, a map of Merseyside which shows you where those appliances will be located. Members will be familiar with uh, previous maps of Merseyside which clearly had less fire engines on than the ones that I am proposing there. As I go on to say, it requires the authority then to find a million pounds to reinvest in those key functions and to affect those, those frontline services, but you'll hear from the Treasurer that we are able to identify those, those, those monies um, through the utilisation of underspend reserves, but we are also able to do that in a sustainable way. We are able to pay off debt, which will release <coughs> revenue from them to mean that these investments are not just one-off, you know, they are sustainable in the longer term. But those alternative proposals all, also allow us to recruit people into Merseyside who reflect the communities we serve, continue to staff the combined platform ladder on a permanent basis rather than previous arrangements which was on a, a complementary cruise arrangement. It will still allow us to build a new station at St. Helens on the basis of providing improved operational response. Uh, it will allow us to conclude in the next couple of weeks uh, the building of a new fire station at Sogo Massey which will allow us to maximise our speed of response into West Will, the likes of Hoy Lake, um, and West Kirby, and we will be able to keep, continue to commit to the redevelopment of our training facilities for our firefighters to ensure that they are best able to deal with the incidents that they are likely to be exposed to. Um, and so that investment of £5 million will be maintained with regards to these plans. <coughs> Which will ensure that Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority um, can increase the capacity to support our aspirations around emergency medical response, which is again a proposal which is in the IMP and contained within that, um, and ensures that we are better equipped to respond to foreseeable and emerging risk. And we can indeed in support the lateral development and progressive development of our staff and respond importantly immediately to the uh, findings of the Her Majesty's Inspectors of Fire and Rescue Services, because they are already things which are being picked up in tranche one. And we, we have already started to make progress against if indeed after the 12 weeks these proposals are enacted and approved by the authority. There are a couple of additional things I would like to draw a thought, you know, members' attention to around new proposals that are contained within this integrated risk management plan. Um, and they are captured within on page 197, which says uh, we will continue to explore opportunities to improve efficiency and effectiveness of the service, including whether the current locations of our fire stations and other buildings allow us to provide the best services and whether there is a scope for any future mergers, and what that looks to kind to assure ourselves that all our fire stations are uh, in the best places to deliver the best possible outcomes for our, 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 our people and our, our, the public of Merseyside, uh, and if there are opportunities to uh, secure from government transformation and efficiencies fund, we would take that um, and seek to deliver that on your behalf. Um, and then the other new proposals are captured on page 200 of uh, the IRMP, or the interim IRMP and the supplement. It says we will explore the feasibility of introducing, introducing drone capability, uh, which will be provided on a retained basis by crews operating from the hybrid station, or one of the hybrid stations. A drone has been used really, really effectively by other fire and rescue services now in the, the, the resolution of large scale protracted operational incidents. Um, and given the fact that we could operate it from one of the drone stations in a really efficient and effective way, we are now seeking to explore that opportunity. It also supports the development of our staff, new skills and new capabilities. Uh, we will also explore the use of technology to support the mobilisation of our resources to operational uh, incident types, utilising mobile phone capabilities to better inform the mobilisation and dispatch of fire appliances. And I've uh, used an example here which is 
9999, which is utilized by the West Midlands Fire and Rescue Service. In effect, what that means is our fire control would be at a future point in time be able to get access to the mobile phone of an individual who called in uh, the services of the Fire and Rescue Service and be able to show them what that they were being exposed to. So if you think about um, some of the imagery from Grenfell Tower maybe, we will be able to relay that information directly back into our fire control and our fire control will be able to take action based on the information that they can see before them. Again, that's a new proposal within this IMP. And then in light of the findings of, of the inspectorate, um, we are seeking to enhance the information we hold about risks which are outside of Merseyside. Key facets of the work we do <coughs> is nationally based, but certainly we have 13, 16 arrangements, so cross-border arrangements with other fire and rescue services, and we are seeking seek to extend that by sharing the risk information in, a, in a probably a more effective way than we do now. And that extends also to training and exercising against cross-border risks that we may, we may be exposed to, or certainly <laughs> our neighbouring fire rescue service may be exposed to if they come into, into Merseyside. As I say, all of those new proposals, which are in, in my view as the Chief Fire Officer, are far better than the proposals we would suggest in the first instance um, and can be delivered with that £1 million of investments. And we know that that £1 million worth of investment is, you know, is, is sustainable in the longer term based on the information that Ian has presented. Um, I would be you know, suggesting that the authority approve these proposals um, and we take that forward to a consultation process. Uh, again, on that basis, we are seeking then to open up the consultation around our new proposals, our supplements of the IRP on the 14th of March. Uh, then those proposals then will extend the IRP from 1720 to in effect 1721 or 1921, if you are looking specifically at the supplemented documents, um, which also allows us to better understand the financial position we will be in post-2020, because we will have had comprehensive spending review in 2019. We will know financially where we are at. Uh, we will be able to deliver these plans up until that point, and we'll be able to take those proposals forward. Um, but big members need to be assured on, on, on one thing also, as, as the Chief Fire Officer picks up on the points that Councillor Kenny has risen, um, which is that we will be having to conclude our lobbying, and our, and our lobbying to government uh, continues on the basis of seeking to secure additional funding in for Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service. So whilst I am very pleased that that will come up with proposals which will deliver 35 clients at any particular point in time for Merseyside, I still think there is more for us to do and the public of Merseyside could be better served with additional financial investment <coughs> in the service. Uh, and as such, we will be making a, a strong representation around the Comprehensive Spending Review 2019 and as part, part of the Fair Funding Review which will take place over the course of the next number of months. And members should be assured that my, you know, my focus on lobbying governments is, is, is unfettered by the proposals that you are seeing before you. I'm chair, I'm happy to take any questions around the proposals themselves. Well, thank you. This has been a total de force. Uh, you know, as we started this year out, I didn't think we'd be in this position now. So thank you. Thank you for the vision. Questions? Just a, a basic one, if we go to you, um, page 200, please. No. And <coughs> the one about the drone capability, you're probably aware because of what's happened in certain airports that the new law could be introduced on a three and a half mile exclusion zone. <coughs> Would we be able to get permission to, to work within them? Because I know that there's been some things put forward to government and they've been rejected. Um, and let's be honest, we're talking about three and a half miles from Speak Airport, for example. That would take in an awful lot of, of, of area. And I was just wondering if that's been looked at.